went to 15, five minutes of pain. You had the five minutes of pain last time. Yeah. Okay, good morning. It is 9 a.m. Welcome to the June 20th, 2018 City Council meeting. Let the record reflect that all City Council members and officials are present. Um, just a couple of announcements. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, July 3rd, and then we're on our summer schedule, which was published in the newspaper today. July, we have July 3rd and July 11th. So we have July 3rd and July 11th. So that's our summer schedule for July. Tuesday, July 3rd, and then Wednesday, July 11th. So one week apart. Um, and just to let you know that Gary and I are both post-surgical, so we are going to be taking a couple of breaks today for our comfort and health. <coughs> so you may see us get up and leave. But Okay, if you would please stand for an invocation and pledge of allegiance, I'd appreciate it. Our Heavenly Father, we ask for your help as we share our individual and collective gifts with our community to refurbish our intentions in a regular manner, to give of ourselves in ways that make a value difference to our families, to our neighbors, to our town and our nation. All these things we pray. Amen. Amen. John. Welcome. We have two special proclamations this morning, the first of which Council Member Matthews will present, which is Punta Gorda Blood Donation Day. With my pleasure. Um, this is a proclamation for the city of Punta Gorda, Florida. Whereas blood is the gift of life, the most precious gift that anyone can give to another person. And whereas today's donors are tomorrow's heroes, a decision to donate blood can save up to three people's lives and just three teaspoons of blood can save a baby's life. And whereas donating blood has many health benefits for the donor, from reducing the risk of having a heart attack or stroke to discovering potential underlying health issues. And whereas one out of every three people will need blood in their lifetime. The demand is constant, but the supply is not. There is no substitute for blood. Only volunteer blood donors can roll up their sleeves and save lives. And whereas the big red bus will be parked in front of City Hall on June 26, 2018, from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. to receive donations. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does hereby proclaim June 26, 2018, as Punta Gorda Blood Donation Day, and encourages all citizens to take the time to roll up their sleeves and save a life. Passed and duly adopted this 20th day of January 2018, Rachel Kiesling, Mayor. And accepting will be Lori O'Brien. Come on up. Come up and get your certificate. Congratulations. I think you'd like to say a few words at the podium. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lori O'Brien. I'm the account representative for One Blood, the Big Red Bus, and I'm so excited to be here. And thank you so much, uh, the city council, the mayor, the city manager, the city clerk, and um, last but not least, the human resources department here at the city of Punta Gorda um, for all their efforts, and especially our chairperson, uh, Jeff Payne, who his enthusiasm and um, promoting the drive, um, really, we are so appreciated of all his efforts for promoting the blood drives when they're here at the city of Punta Gorda. Punta Gorda is proclaiming the date of Tuesday, June 26, as the blood donation day in Punta Gorda. The big red bus, as they said, would be here on June 26 from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. I'd like to take this opportunity, as in the proclamation, to really urge all, all of you, uh, actually a plea, um, summertime is upon us and um, the need for blood still remains, uh, though a lot of our population has um, gone north. So I really would, really would like to plea to have you all just come out to the big red bus and see if you're able to donate. Um, blood cannot be manufactured and patients need blood transfusions every day. These transfusions are possible through the acts of selfless blood donors who give of themselves to save lives. 
Warm Blood values our community partnership with the city of Punta Gorda and are very appreciative of you hold, hosting blood drives. Again, thank you for proclaiming this day as Blood Donation Day in Punta Gorda, and thank you for all for sharing your power and saving lives. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, it's my honor to present Amateur Radio Week, Proclamation City of Punta Gorda, Florida. Whereas, City of Punta Gorda has more than 170 licensed amateur radio operators providing emergency radio communications in times of need. And whereas the Punta Gorda members of the Peace River Radio Association have demonstrated their value in public service to the community by providing such communications. And whereas these amateur radio operators provide their service free of charge to the community as well as to the world at large and are available to render communications assistance during any local or national disaster. And whereas these amateur radio operators will develop their emergency communication skills by participating in the Amateur Radio Relay League Incorporated Field Day exercises on June 23rd and 24th, 2018. Now therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida does hereby proclaim the week of June 18th to June 24, 2018 as Amateur Radio Week in recognition of this important emergency preparedness exercise and calls upon citizens to pay appropriate tribute to the amateur radio operators of their community. Passed and duly adopted in regular session this 20th day of June, 2018, City of Punta Gorda, Florida, Rachel Kiesling Mayor. We have many members here, but Ron will be accepting the proclamation on their behalf. Thank you for coming. You want to talk about your event? Okay. Great shirt. Thank you, dear. She doesn't know Turner Amateur Radio Radio Operator over with the microphone, so I'll take her. No, it's going to be real quick. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and um, to the uh, City Council here for uh, our recognition here. Um, yes, I'm with uh, Peace River Radio Association. My name is Ron Farley. My radio name is KG4QIV, and you'll hear that call sign on the air this weekend. And um, it is the uh, largest one day on the air event in America. And uh, we would like to invite the city council and everybody in the room, including the whole city of Punta Gorda. Uh, we will have our event at the Punta Gorda Boat Club starting about <coughs> 2 um, p.m. on Saturday. And we'll have uh, all kind of uh, radios set up. You can get on the air and chat with people if you like around the world, or you can sit and watch. And uh, we're going to have um, a few electronic projects and stuff. But it's a fun event. And um, so what all that um, ends up simulating is um, on the air emergency uh, preparedness training. And um, we do all kind of crazy stuff um, during our Irma event. Um, my wife and myself, we actually slept under the radio desk at Fawcett Hospital, so we manned the facility up there for 24 hours during Irma. So we do all kind of crazy stuff, but we try to have a little fun. So thank you very much, and look forward to seeing you guys this weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is introduction of board or committee member nominees. If your name is in the running for a board or committee and you would like to take a few minutes to introduce yourself, now would be the time. Do we have anybody who's submitted their name for a board or committee position that would like to introduce themselves? Okay, seeing nobody rising, we will move into the public hearing agenda, and we do have one public hearing, and then we have two quasi-judicial public hearings, the first of which is ZA08-18. Yes, and this is the um, first reading of an ordinance that I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, amending Chapter 26, Land Development Regulations, Punta Gorda Code, Article 3, Regulating Districts, Section 3.10, HC Highway Commercial District, Subsection F, to allow permanent canopy shade structures as a use permitted by special exception, and amending Section 4.39 to provide for conditions and specifications relating to permanent canopy shade structures, providing for conflict and severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you. Good morning, Lisa Hannon, zoning official. Um, in 2013, um, an ordinance 1770-13 was added to permit, or was adopted to permit permanent canopy shade structures for recreational facilities and playgrounds. Um, 
staff received a request in 2016 from an automotive um, related business to add a canopy shade structure. Um, it was not permitted, the code didn't allow it. Um, he appealed to city council and they did uh, vote unanimously to authorize the installation of that structure contingent upon meeting requirements of section 4.39 which he did. Staff was further directed to amend the code to tweak the language for commercial uses um, through the special exception process and the draft ordinances um, hereby submitted. Questions for staff? No. Not at this time. Okay, this is a public hearing. If you would like to speak on ZA07-18, now would be the time. Please take your, the podium to my right here. State your name and you will have three minutes. ZA07-18, anybody like to speak on this public hearing? <clears throat> anybody like to speak on ZA07-18? Last call, please rise and make your way over to this podium to my right. Move to close public hearing. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. I have a question. Sure. Um, I know that the request that came in before was it, it is an automotive um, business is there is there a need for us to restrict this to automotive that's what we were directed to um, so it, it would be up to the council if you did not want to restrict it to or you wanted to allow it for other types of businesses but they would have to be permanent style and they do have to come in for a special exception for these. They couldn't be just like the little pop-up tents. Mm -hmm. Those are allowed like with a special event or grand opening as long as they're removed at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That brings another question up. Mm -hmm. um, so do, do, are they gonna have to apply for a permit to put these structures up or? Yes. So it, okay. They have to apply for a special exception and a permit when it's in the Highway Commercial Zoning District okay. automotive related, okay. yes ma'am. The permit being a building permit. Correct, building permit. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering why, you know, thinking about it, why, even though, the, you know, that this was an automotive use, but there could potentially be other uses, is it something we really need to um, make it exclusive to automotive? I think the thought behind that at the time was that, you know, they're working outside. Yes. So if, if they're not working outside, I don't know that there's a need for them to have a shade structure. That's the only thing I could think of that. That's might. normally where we get the request from would be an auto dealer or a, um, uh, the car wash because they are detailing cars outside. Okay. Uh, some of the other businesses we normally do not get any okay. requests for. Yes. I just just a comment. I could envision a uh, a restaurant wanting to do something of the sort for, with outdoor dining and have a safe shade structure which in a garden type atmosphere if they were to want to and I don't think we'd want to restrict that. That could be very you know accommodating and, mm -hmm. and nice accoutrement. So I could see potentially other businesses being able to make advantage of such a structure. So yeah. Lisa's comments are correct. This is you know, how, when this ordinance was originally adopted, the direction of the city council. However, because it does require a special exception, and special exceptions um, require that you take into consideration the individual circumstance and the individual poten um, uh, um, potential uh, harm to the neighborhood, you know, there really wouldn't be any um, um, reason why you couldn't remove the limitation with respect to um, the automobile dealers and do it on a, on a case-by-case case basis as they apply for a special exception. That would require that this um, ordinance not only be uh, um, amended to allow for that uh, um, purpose, it would also require um, a re-advertising uh, and a new public hearing um, to, to accomplish that. You, you couldn't accomplish that today. You can give us the direction and we can bring it back. Mm. Did you have your hand up? I was waving. Oh, you're waving to somebody. Okay. I do have a comment. Um, okay, and the, the other part of the, that we, the discussion that we had in the past was where this thing was going to be located, which it does say it needs to be located behind the primary building and not visible from any public right-of-way, which is what I think we went through with the car wash is where are they actually going to put this because we don't want to see them lining, you know, 41 by any means. So um, I'm okay with passing this, and then if, if we do get 
further requests, we could amend it at that time. Howard. Um, the history behind this, which goes a long way back, mm -hmm. is aesthetics. Along our highway commercial, it's aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's limited the way it is. Okay. Yeah. Have we ha heard any other requests since? No. Not at this time. Okay. No, okay. So what's your pleasure? I'll move to um, approve. Second. Motion and a second to approve ZA 07 18. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. And this will come back for a second Sorry, reading. Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, next, we have two quasi judicial public hearings, which requires anybody who wants to speak to be sworn. So I will let the attorney and clerk take care of that. Well, anyone who is going to be providing evidence or testimony to speak on, on these two items, please rise to be sworn by the city clerk. <coughs> Raise your right hands, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in today's proceedings? I do. I do. When you come to the podium to speak, please state your name and indicate that you have been sworn. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, first ordinance is, is PD-01-18, which is the first reading of an ordinance that I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the city of Punta Gorda, Florida, rezoning 4.02 plus or minus acres, generally described as 900 West Marion Avenue, Punta Gorda, Florida, and more particularly described as all of Block 13, city of Punta Gorda, According to the map or plat thereof is recorded in plat book one, page one and, tw and 23, public records of Charlotte County, Florida. From its current z zoning classification of neighborhood residential, 15 units per acre, to planned development neighborhood PDN, providing for conflict and servability and providing effective date. Good morning, Lisa Hannon, zoning official for the record, and I have been sworn. I'd like to enter our staff report into the record by reference. The property is the former U Impact University. Um, it's been vacant for several years. The property is currently zoned neighborhood residential 15 units per acre, which only permits residential uses. Um, in 1992, the Impact University uh, use was approved by special exception for the use of a university. The special exception was terminated um, because of discontinuance of use in 2011. The applicant purchased the property to complement and support Fisherman's Village. In order to place the vacant buildings back into use, a rezoning is required. Staff concludes that the rezoning request, the request of rezoning the plan development neighborhood is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and future land use map. The request reduces overall density from 15 density units per acre to 2.24 density units per acre. The rezoning will repurpose an existing development, enhancing the city's tax base. Bicycle parking facilities will be required prior to certificate of completion of the project. Signage shall re, um, be reviewed under a separate permit when necessary, and all the landscaping um, will be required to be brought up to the current code. Urban Design and Punta Gorda Planning Commission recommended approval of this request. Thank you. Any questions for staff before we allow the applicant to present? Mm -mm. Nope. And just to remind everybody in quasi-judicial, the applicant does have 30-minute time to make her presentation. <clears throat> does, the, does the ELMO work? Uh, no, because no, the projector's not projector. working. That's not going to work. It's not going to work? No. Okay. We'll, we'll make it work another way. Jerry Waxler, McCrory Law Firm. I have been sworn. I'm representing 900 West Marion Avenue, which is requesting a rezoning from neighborhood residential 15 to plan development. As Ms. Hannon indicated, this site was purchased to complement support Fisherman's Village, which is also owned by the applicant's members. The proposed rezoning would retain the existing configuration of the site, no changes to the existing footprint are proposed, and no new buildings are proposed, but allow for the establishment of a mixed-use project. The applicant will renovate all existing multi-story buildings, 
and what I had hoped to show you, Building 1, as labeled on the concept plan, which is the building that is uh, parallel to West Retta across from the park, will be converted to a hotel with 25 rooms. Building 2, which is the building that is parallel to Marion Avenue, West Marion Avenue, will house the Military Heritage Museum and office space. The exact square footage of each use has been intentionally removed from the PD ordinance to allow the project to adapt or increase with the changing needs of the museum uh, without us having to come back to ask for a PD modification. So we simply list as a use a museum. That has caused some concern. But I want to you all to understand, OK, there you go. Building one is the hotel. Building two, the offices and the Military Heritage Museum. I wanted to explain why, in the ordinance in front of you, it just lists museum as a use and not Military Heritage Museum. This is a legal document. If you flip through your codes, you will see that using the general category is consistent with what you find in your codes. So for instance, you may see a permitted use uh, not a permitted use for this project, but in your commercial zoning district's restaurant. It doesn't say uh, Tula's. It doesn't say um, Subway. It just lists restaurant because that has a permitted use. So consistent with that, even though the intent is that this will house the Military Heritage Museum, it simply says museum in your ordinance. Increasing museum space and a concurrent reduction in office space will actually reduce your peak hour traffic to and from the site. So the conclusions of the traffic analysis, which were submitted in support of this application, remain valid. Building two, again here, will also house a 244 seat auditorium. The auditorium is envisioned as an amenity for both this site and for guests of the resort at Fisherman's Village. Movies, entertainment, presentations can all be offered in the auditorium. It will not be open to the general public and will not generate any traffic. Building three, that's the building here, will be converted to nine condominium units. As I stated before, all buildings will maintain their existing footprints. They will maintain their general um, aesthetics. When we talk about renovation, they need to be repainted. There may be some balconies installed for the hotel. But in general, the site will look essentially the same with the approval of this rezoning as without it. The only new construction proposed is a driveway connection from building three to building one. That's this little section that you see right here. This will allow um, for better site flow and the ability to move through the entire site so that you are not just limited if you're staying here to coming out on West Retta Esplanade. You now have the ability to come back through. You can head down uh, West Merriam. Uh, it just makes for better flow through the site, and that's the reason for that. The only other proposed new construction would be this area here, which is labeled as multi-use. It may house, in the future, recreational facilities, potentially some enhanced parking. The mixed-use area in that corner ensures that the project will always have sufficient on-site parking. Right now, for the uses we have proposed, there is more than enough parking under your code. Um, so there is no additional parking required at this time. But we have built into the approval the ability to create additional parking or recreational amenities should the needs arise, need arise as, um, for instance, if the Military Heritage Museum grows and requires additional parking. The proposed PD is compatible and consistent with the comprehensive plan. A detailed narrative addressing the consistency with the comprehensive plan was provided as part of the uh, application. It addressed all the applicable goals, objectives, and policies. After analyzing the request, staff also found it to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. A transportation study, as I indicated, was also included with the application. The study found that adopted levels of service will be maintained on all surrounding roadways. Our transportation engineer, Reed Fellows, is here and can answer any questions if you specifically have some. The placement of the buildings on the site already exceed required setbacks for the area. As I stated, available parking also exceeds what is required under your code. Existing landscape buffers here, here, and here will be enhanced and maintained. We are not proposing a buffer here because this area of the project is across the street from a park and so the need for a buffer is just, it, it's just not needed at this point. At the Planning Commission hearing, a resident of Sunset Breeze's condos expressed concern that the proposed hotel will negatively impact their condo and create a slippery slope of additional hotel development on other sites. The Sunset Breeze's condo, here's your linear park, 
You have a vacant parcel here, and the Sunset Breezes condo is located over here. I want to point out that the proposed hotel is adjacent to the proposed condos on our site. So there's an inherent incentive to make sure that the hotel use is compatible with adjacent residential use. The western boundary of the site is already buffered. We'll have our landscape buffer plus the buffer of the linear park, which will never go away. Um, and the approval of zoning on one parcel does not set a precedent for zoning on an additional parcel. So we think that provides further protections. Any potential for hotel development on the site, which is zoned residential here, would have to come back to you in a public hearing been approved and be approved based on competent substantial evidence. Our proposed rezoning will permit mixed residential and commercial use on a property that previously contained only non-residential uses. The project was presented to the Punta Gorda District 1 Homeowners Association, who did not voice any objections. The former impact site has been vacant for many years. It was designed as a special purpose site to house the impact offices and to provide a location for training and for ultimately for impact university. The requested rezoning will allow the site to transition from its former office university use to a mixed use site with offices, museums, a hotel, and condominiums. The proposed redevelopment benefits the city by efficiently utilizing existing infrastructure and broadening the city's tourist amenities and options. The rezoning actually reduces density in your coastal high hazard area. It diversifies the city's tax base by incorporating new commercial uses, the proposed offices and the hotel. But perhaps most importantly, it will allow a long dormant site to once again become a vibrant part of the community. The Planning Commission recommended approval of this rezoning. Staff has recommended approval of this rezoning. We stand on their comprehensive report and respectfully request a recommend, uh, not a recommendation, we respectfully request approval of this plan development rezoning. I'm available as is the project engineer and our transportation engineer if you have any questions. Thank you. Questions for the applicant? Yes. Um, Jerry, why is it a problem to specifically name the Military Heritage Museum? Since we're approving the site plan overall to include this and this and this and this and we have a hotel, why would they not be willing to stipulate that it is the Military Heritage Museum? And, and we would be willing to stipulate that it is the Military Heritage Museum. The ordinance, which was prepared by your staff and which we were asked to revise, simply states museum to be consistent with the way you call out uses in your code. But as city council, if you want to stipulate that the museum is the Military Heritage Museum, we have no objection to that. Okay, and it's my understanding that they're going to get approximately 5,000 square feet on two floors in that building? Is it that is. The, again, we took out any <coughs> reference to specific square footage. The original proposal showed 2,000 square feet in ongoing discussions with the Military Heritage Museum. We now understand they, they would like additional square footage, so we eliminated the 2,000 so you wouldn't have a limitation and didn't put in any specific amount because if they need 5,000 today but need 5,500 square feet two years from now, we don't want to have to come back to amend the ordinance. So we left it as just the use, and the square footage can be amended, um, increased as, as necessary. They're still in negotiations. They have not finalized the new lease, and so it, we, we didn't want to lock ourselves in to anything that we would then have to come back and amend at the end of the negotiations. Okay. Any other questions? Military Heritage Museum is here, so I'm sure we're going to hear from them as well. Yep, Nancy? Um, what kind of um, amenities are planned for the hotel? Potentially a pool, and we have a couple of open space areas, so potentially a pool, perhaps a pergola or a, a um, I always forget the name. A pavilion. Yeah. <laughs> it's something along those lines. Um, and then we also have in, in here, which is more buffered from everything, you know, the potential to put some sport courts or something along those lines, but typical amenities like you would see for either a hotel or for the condominiums. What, uh, what about food service? Yeah. Uh, at this point, we have not provided any um, that is not listed in the PD, so food service is not anticipated, If and, and we don't anticipate wanting to offer that. If at any point in the distant future that was something that became um, a need that they would want, we would have to come back before you in a public hearing to go to amend the ordinance. It does not provide for it right now. So basically, this is going to be a boutique-type hotel uh, that you would see like in a, in, a, in a large city that's surrounded by a bunch of restaurants anyway because it's only 25 rooms or whatever it is. It's, it's just 25 yeah. rooms. Typically what I understand you need 100 rooms to make a hotel work as a standalone. Obviously it's not a standalone. Hotel. Well again because th we, we talked at the beginning about this is complementing and supporting Fisherman's Village. We 
my clients can do 25 rooms because they have the amenities walking distance away at Fisherman's Village. There you have all the restaurants you could ever want. Um, you have shopping, you have entertainment. So there's no need to provide that here because essentially it will become part of that, that larger organization. Any other questions before we open the public hearing? No? Okay, please stand by. This is a public hearing, PD 1-18. If you would like to speak on this public hearing, please take this podium to my right. State your name that you have been sworn. You have three minutes. This is Tom Hamilton. I have been sworn. My, my question, I guess, uh, is where will the 240 people who could fit in this auditorium park? Um, it's just, you know, uh, there's not enough parking on the site or anything like this, which means they would overflow into the neighborhood. Now, I know you say, well, we may not, uh, we won't allow 240 people there, but we don't know what kind of events might take place in the future and all. And I'm just saying, thinking forward, where will they park? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak on PD 1-18? Please take the podium to my right, state that you've been sworn. You have three minutes. Anybody want to speak on PD 01-18? Last call for anybody to speak. If anybody else would like to speak, you can make your way to the podium now. Good morning. I'm Dr. Kathy Roth, and I have been duly sworn. I, um, uh, on behalf of the Board of Directors for the Military Heritage Museum and our Executive Director, I just want to say... Um, that we are really, really thrilled with the possibility of being able to move the museum from its current location to Building B. And uh, we are actively engaged with the general manager as well as the ownership to do that. We are working on a lease and that um, is going well. Um, we, um, we believe we're going to bring a world-class museum to Punta Gorda for the first time ever in 17 years. We will be able to display all of our artifacts, and it will be infused uh, with a, a, a wonderful visitor engagement with technology and a futures room uh, for young people to come and land planes and things like that using technology. We're very excited about the possibility. I served in the Army for 25 years, and I believe I can speak for veterans who in this area who are wanting this museum to be uh, to fulfill its full potential. And um, Madam Mayor and City Council members, thank you for your support. Uh, we can't wait to get the keys to the kingdom to start getting in and getting moved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? Last call for PD 01-18. Move to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion and second to close the public hearing. All in favor? There was a, I think Jerry. She's going to, okay, let's I, leave I it open. I just wanted to okay. respond to Mr. Hamilton's Parking. question. As I stated in the presentation, the auditorium exists. It, it, it's already in the building. Um, and there is no intention at this part, point to open it to the public. It will be for the use of the people staying uh, on this site or for guests of Fisherman's Village. Fisherman's Village is walkable. They also have golf carts that can ferry people back and forth. We are over parked for the site in terms of right now we have some additional parking and the potential for extra parking if it's needed. But at this point, it is not open to the public and therefore won't generate the kind of need for parking that it would if it was open to the public. So we believe we can safely accommodate you know, those needs on this site with the existing and with the ability for additional, as well as since we control Fisherman's Village to, you know, utilize the golf carts and, and require people to, to walk the, the few feet over. Thanks. Thank you. Now we can close the public hearing. Second. <laughs> Who made the mo first motion? I, I did. You did? Okay. I did. Motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. Um, Discussion. I, I would like to make sure we include something specific to the Military Heritage Museum in the documentation that's approved since it is part of the overall plan um, just for the protection of the Military Heritage Museum, if nothing else, um, because they are in a situation right now where they don't currently have a lease that they're, work, they're working with. And I would like to know that they are going to be taken care of and be able to move into the building without any, any further 
um, issues concerning a lease. And this is, since we're, we're approving such specific things in this proposal, I think that it warrants having their name specific to this document to um, exhibit B. And, and I would make a motion to that effect. I'll second it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in, in consideration that uh, everybody seems to be agreeable to it anyway. Mm -hmm. Why not? Well, before we make that a specific condition of the rezoning, I'd like to hear that the uh, applicant um, would have no objection to that and would stipulate to that. And the applicant has no objection to that. Okay. Then my motion stands. Second. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel comfortable. It's a little protection for them, but we've only heard positive, and they've been working together for how many years up until this point? I don't imagine anything going south, but if it, if, you know, if we want to get to the devil in the details, we can certainly do I that. I guess my point is that at any point in time, when it doesn't specify what museum, um, Fisherman's Village might come in and say, we want to put open up a museum that shows the history of Fisherman's Village. I mean, any museum could then occupy the space. That was the only thing I was trying to bring, bring up. And, and, I, and I think it'll give peace of mind to the Military Heritage Museum Board as well. Yes. I think uh, to, to augment Lynn's opinion a little bit, I don't think there's any question of the <coughs> intent of the present ownership of Fisherman's Village and, and the relationship that they have with the museum. I don't right. think that's the I question. Agree. That's correct. But you don't know what's going to happen 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. You know, if ownership changes or... Or, or what have you, I just see that as a, maybe a little bit. Plus, I also quite frankly see it as a statement from city council of saying, what's taking you so long? <laughs> uh, so I, I see it also as a, uh, a, a, a also a s small gesture of, of approval and support from city council mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. for this endeavor. And I compliment both parties on, on going forward with this. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Thank you. Any other discussion? We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay, next we have another quasi-judicial public hearing. We have Z02-18. Yes, and this is the first reading of an ordinance, which I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, rezoning .90 plus or minus acres, generally described as units 1 through 12 of Isles Colony Condominium, apartments number Roman numeral 2, the condominium, According to the Declaration of Condominium recorded in OR Book 182, page one, uh, excuse me, 418, and all exhibits and amendments thereof, public records of Charlotte County, Florida. From general multifamily 15 units per acre through neighborhood center, providing for conflict and severability and providing an effective date. Thank you. Good morning, Lisa Hannon, zoning official, and I have been sworn. I would like to enter our staff report into the record by reference in its entirety, including exhibits. A and Exhibit B, which has been attached here too to the staff report. Staff feels that this is consistent with the comprehensive plan, including but not limited to land use, with all the goals, objectives, and policies of the comprehensive plan and future land use. I will, I will read our findings into record. Finding number one, the property is currently zoned general multifamily 15 units per acre, GM 15. <laughs> The proposed zoning of Neighborhood Center will retain the density, however, the preliminary proposal is for five residential units. In addition, a commercial component is proposed <coughs> on the corner of the property abutting West Marion Avenue and Jamaica Way. Finding number two, there are sufficient public facilities including water, wastewater, and solid waste collection. All drainage and stormwater facilities along with traffic impacts will be reviewed for compliance at the time of development. Under exhibits A and B attached here too, all relevant comprehensive plan citations have been included. Conclusion number one, the multifamily zone property has been vacant since 2005. The property opposite the intersection is zone neighborhood center and currently houses professional offices. The proposal, conclusion number two, the proposal includes five single family residences and a commercial component within the permitted uses listed under the Neighborhood Center Zoning District. Conclusion number three, the rezoning request is consistent with the city's adopted comprehensive plan 2040, specifically the future land use element, which states in part, the city of Punta Gorda with its mixed use land use category seeks to blend these non-residential uses with residential uses to produce neighborhoods that host a more complete array of daily goods, 
and services to meet the needs of the residents and visitors alike. Staff recommended conditions of approval. All future commercial and or multifamily development will require development review prior to construction. And based upon the findings and conclusions along with the attached exhibits A and exhibits B, Urban Design recommends approval of the rezoning request 02-18-1700 Jamaica Way. The City of Punta Gorda Planning Commission recommended approval 5-2 of the rezoning request. Thank you. Questions for staff? Okay, the applicant does have a 30 minute time frame for a presentation. Good morning, Jerry Waxel with the McCrory Law Firm. I have been sworn. I'm representing 1700 Jamaica Way LLC, which is requesting a rezoning from General Multifamily 15 to Neighborhood Center. The site was previously developed with a condominium building that was severely damaged during Hurricane Charlie. Eventually, the building was demolished and the property has been vacant ever since. The site has frontage on both Marion Avenue, which at this intersection is developed with all non-residential uses, and Jamaica Way, which is a residential road. The proposed neighborhood residential zoning will allow the property to take advantage of its unique location. The plan is for a small portion of the property located at the intersection of West Marion and Jamaica Way to be developed with a small commercial or office use of less than 2,000 square feet. The back of the site, which fronts Jamaica Way with harbor views to the rear, will be divided into five single family home sites. Two-story cottage style homes are proposed with prices starting in the neighborhood of $750,000. The proposed neighborhood center rezoning is the only zoning district that will allow development of both the commercial corner and the narrower cottage lots to the rear. We looked at whether we could retain the residential zoning to the rear and build what was proposed. Your zoning codes do not allow for that. Plan development zoning requires a minimum five acre site. This site is not even an acre. Though the city can vary from this minimum, and we talked about it at the required pre-application, it was determined in that pre-application meeting with staff that the neighborhood center zoning was more appropriate for this site. The proposed rezoning is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Its existing high density residential land use allows for both residential uses and non-residential uses that are compatible with neighborhood development. The intent of the neighborhood center zoning district is to provide for the location of pedestrian scaled shops, services, small workplaces, and residential buildings central to a neighborhood and within walking distance of dwellings. Few sites in Punta Gorda can implement that intent as well as this one. The proposed adjacent residential development will be adjacent to existing residential development. The proposed office commercial development will be across from the Isles Yacht Club and across from the existing model home and office development at the corner of West Marion and Bell Harbor Boulevard. Staff has reviewed the proposed rezoning and concurs that it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and in conformance with your criteria for rezoning. We understand that some in the neighborhood are concerned because the NC district does not bind an applicant to a site plan. The fact that the owner is a residential builder with a long history of building and contributing to the city of Punta Gorda is ignored in favor of labeling him a greedy developer. The fact that the price paid by the owner for this vacant property results in a commercial price per square foot that is four times the appraised price per square of the improved 7-Eleven site at Bell Harbor and Akiesta, and over five times the appraised price per square of the comparably sized developed office parcel directly across the street from this site at the corner of Bell Harbor and West Marion does not persuade opponents that commercial development of the entire site will not provide a developer a reasonable return on investment, much less the vast profits that would surely be demanded by a greedy developer. Their arguments are contradictory. 
They acknowledge that this is essentially a residential parcel, but refuse to concede that this supports my client's statements that developing the site with residential uses is precisely what he intends to do. And opponents ignore the non-residential uses on each of the other three corners of the signalized intersection. Again, the Yacht Club, the Office Complex, and the Model Home Center, and continue to insist that this fourth corner is properly residential. So despite the fact that my client has followed all your rules and regulations, and despite the fact that this request is consistent with your comprehensive plan and implements the intent of the Neighborhood Center District, and despite the fact that this request is strongly supported by your professional planning staff, my client is, and always has been, willing to bind himself to what he is promising. Immediately following the conclusion of the Planning Commission hearing, we tried to engage the neighbors to explain that their concerns could be addressed in a legal and binding document. As my client stated then, he is happy to provide the insurance that what he says is his plan for the property is what will actually be built on the property. To that end, we have already recorded a deed restriction that was passed out to you and passed out to the members of the public that will limit non-residential development, if you could put up the, the, the <coughs> graphic on the pen. It will limit non-residential development only to the southern corner of the property, permitting only residential development on the remainder. And I wanna get that exhibit up so you can see what we're talking about. Not the site plan, the, the, the last page of the deed restriction, please. It, you have it as a separate document. It needs to go in on your overhead projector. It's, it's right here. Ah, there we go. Hard to see, but this area here is limited, is the only area of the site that would be permitted to have non-residential uses, um, including accessory parking. So commercial structures or non-residential structures and accessory parking, limited just to the corner of the site. The remainder, this portion that you see here, would be limited only to residential uses. Now the other important thing that I want to point out to you and to the city council is not only do we place this deed restriction on the property, we gave enforcement rights for this deed restriction to the city of Punta Gorda. So if the property is not used consistent with what I just stated, non-residential limited here, only residential here, the city of Punta Gorda has the ability to enforce that deed restriction. Also in that recorded document is a sentence that states that the deed restriction cannot be modified except with the approval of the city of Punta Gorda. So we can't record it, get what we want approved today, and then go back tomorrow and record a modification to that document to change. The city of Punta Gorda, as I noted, is granted the right to enforce the deed restriction and to amend the deed restriction. My client executed and recorded this restriction because despite the mistrust and the accusations, he has truthfully stated his intended use of the property right from the start. At this point, I'd like to bring Anthony Farhat up, the, the owner of 1700 uh, Jamaica Way, so that you can hear in his own words and see examples of what he plans for the site, and then I'll come back up very briefly for some concluding comments. Anthony? Greetings, Anthony Farhat, I've been sworn. I'm the manager of 1700 Jamaica Way. Uh, so I, I would like to just talk a little bit about the project itself and what our vision is, because I think somewhere along the lines, things got lost in translation as to what our intent was and, and what we actually are capable of doing. This property is nine tenths of one acre. That's it, it's not even an acre. So we have presented a couple slides and this is a conceptual site plan this conceptual site plan would show that we have five residential cottage lots with a small commercial component. The commercial component, the actual structure, would be all the way on the corner of Marion by the signalized corner. And then the parking would be behind it creating a, a landscape buffer all the way around the property. So that, that commercial component would have a landscape buffer. That would also buffer Southwinds condo, which is directly to the east of the property that, that we own. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, Mitchell, thank you. So this is the signalized corner um, that uh, Jerry was referencing in, in her presentation. And what we would be doing is something very small and boutique -y. We have not drawn the commercial building. We have not gone all the way through our civil engineering. We do have an executed contract with the civil engineer pending the outcome of this hearing, of course. So if we go to the next slide, so this is a 
uh, concept of the cottage product that we would like to do. Currently, we are zoned to build a 50-foot concrete building with 13 units with parking underneath. That is how our current zoning is. This would actually restrict us to a 35-foot height restriction. So nothing on that property could exceed 35 feet, particularly important for Southwind, which I'll talk about in a minute. But essentially, these cottage products would be fee simple, and they would be titled to each owner independently. So I could actually chop the property and sell these cottages off to fee simple title holders. And then, of course, there would be the, the corner, um, which is the small commercial component. As far as the architectural style, we want to do the sort of more modern version of the old Florida um, vernacular and have the metal roofs and the gables and the corbels and the lap siding and things of that nature, which we think is very much complementary to the Yacht Club. Uh, if you go to the next slide, this will uh, give you a better picture of the actual setbacks as it relates um, to all the neighbors, but particularly Southwind, which is directly to the east of us. So Southwind's building would be sitting right around this area. And as they look due north across the harbor, I would be directly to their left, which would be the west side of their property. Under our current zoning, we can actually uh, go 20 feet from the seawall on our accessory structure, and we can go 50 feet above base flood. So base flood is 10 foot right now. Uh, our current grade is seven feet. So when you go out there and you look at the property, we can go 53 feet above the grass that's sitting on that property as it currently sits. What we are proposing is, and that's what's in red, by the way, what we are proposing is in green. It would limit us to a 35 foot height restriction, and it would limit us to a 25 foot setback off the seawall. So we'd be five foot farther away and 15 foot shorter. And of course, with the cottages, we would have breezeway separation in between the units that would also pro provide for sunlight and things of that nature. The reason I think this is particularly important is as it relates to angle of light and sun exposure, uh, you can see the impact we would have on south wind under the current zoning, which we're, we're clearly allowed to do, but it would be a dramatic impact as it relates to those units and blocking the sunset view um, where what I'm doing is gonna open up a lot more sky. Uh, in addition, of course, it's much lower density. So if, if anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll be here and I can answer those, but I think that sums up, uh, just to give everybody an idea of what we actually wanna do. I'd also like to point out that with this recorded deed restriction, my client must put residential on the rear of the property. It is, again, in my client's best interest. If, if commercial development is truly going to impact property values, it's impacting his property values as well. He would not put up a commercial development that would impact his ability to sell these five uh, lots and their three quarter of a million dollar plus homes. Uh, and I wanted to be sure that, that I made that point. This request meets the standards set forth for a rezoning in your LDRs. You heard that from your staff. It's contained in the staff report. It was addressed in the application, which we submitted in support of this request. It is consistent with your comprehensive plan. Again, the application can, can contained a detailed analysis talking about the uh, applicable goals, policies, and objectives, and how this supports or is consistent with them. Staff also provided that analysis and it concurs that this is consistent with your comprehensive plan. Based on these findings, it's recommended for approval by your professional unbiased planning staff. It was recommended for approval by your planning commission. And there is now in place an enforceable guarantee that this parcel will be developed as represented. 1700 Jamaica Way LLC requests approval of this rezoning to Neighborhood Center. I'm available if you have any questions, as is Mr. Farhat. Questions for the applicant before we open the public hearing? Yes. Be before we uh, hear from the public, I I'd like to make a couple of comments. Okay. Um, first, um, my grandson Liam is in the seventh grade, visiting with me, and is taking a summer class in civics. So for his benefit and also for the benefit of some of the members of the public, I'd like to give a, a, a brief description of the legal requirements as they relate to rezoning. In contrast to the previous public hearing, which had to do with a planned development, um, <clears throat> where the city has the ability to specifically understand the proposed uses in that development and provide limitations as it relates to the proposed uses in that planned development. 
in a rezoning, <coughs> it is an absolute determination by the planning uh, by the planning commission and also by the city council as to whether or not, in concept, the property is appropriate to be rezoned to a particular district, taking into consideration all of the possible permitted uses that are provided for in our zoning code for that district. We do not have the lawful authority to restrict one or more of the permitted uses in that district. By the same token, um, it's not appropriate to consider nice artic uh, uh, architect renderings of the structures that are gonna be provided for, um, voluntary limitations with respect to heights and setbacks. The applicant who ultimately gets a rezoning uh, is entitled to all of the permitted restrictions, uh, uses, et cetera. <clears throat> now, the applicant in this case has provided us with a declaration of restrictive covenants with uh, expressing the intention that um, certain limitations will be self-imposed and have been self-imposed on this property. I would submit to you, and let me, let me digress a little bit. We've all watched drama, courtroom dramas on TV where a witness blurts out some testimony, an attorney objects, and the judge says to the jury, I instruct you to disregard the witness's statements and do not use that as a basis for your determination. Well, at this point, um, I'm going to take sort of like the role of the judge. It's very nice that the applicant has provided these restrictions, and hopefully that may alleviate some of the concerns of the neighbors. But it is not within your province to be able to take that restriction into consideration when granting or denying a rezoning. Again, it's a, it's a determination on your part as to whether or not the rezoning that's requested to the uh, neighborhood center is an appropriate change of the zoning subject to any <coughs> permissible use in our zoning code. So with that, I believe we can open it up to the public. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. So then how does this apply? It, 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 only, it, it should not apply to your determination. <clears throat> what it should apply to is the um, maybe the objections that the public might have otherwise without knowing that the applicant has voluntarily restricted himself to a particular use. Mm -hmm. But again, so then it's not for our consideration as to how he intends to specifically use the property. Theoretically, he can use it for any one of the permitted uses within the NC district. Lisa, you want to give a sort of a broad brush idea of what those permitted uses might be generally? While she's doing that, the reason why I ask is what I'm, so what you're really saying is this is the assurance that this has already been taken, this has already taken place. Correct. So this is the property owner's um, guarantee, if you will, Correct. to the public. Correct. That this is, if I get this, this is what I will do. Correct. And this, so it, it really isn't, um, will not become a part of our record per se as it relates to this um, quasi-judicial public hearing it's today. A, it's a part of the record because it's submitted, but but it is a part of the record which would be improper for you to base your determination as to whether to grant or deny the um, special exception. Just like in the in the trial Coming. situation, it would be improper for the jury to disregard the admonishment of the judge and make a determination based on the improper testimony that was presented at the hearing at the trial. In other words, it's in the record just because it's a document that's been submitted, mm -hmm. but the record uh, of your approval must stand without consideration of this document. Which is the nature of a rezoning. It's Correct. basically a yes or no. Correct. Yes. Their conditions are not, like what you said with the PD, is totally different than what we're doing now. And we, we all right. understand that. Understand. Correct. Understood. Gary. I just want to be clear, though, for the public's knowledge, that this is an enforceable guarantee. Yes, yes it is. <coughs> okay, Lisa Hannon, zoning official. Permitted principal uses would be commercial or office buildings up to a maximum of 10,000 square feet in total area. 
restaurants, excluding drive through conference centers, hospital medical uses, bed and breakfast in, single family duplex dwellings, multifamily projects up to 15,000 square feet, civic uses, research development, service organizations, indoor theaters, vocational technical school centers, parks, recreational facilities, banks. Those are permitted principal uses and structures. Thank you. Okay, are we ready for the public hearing? Yes. Okay, this is a public hearing. If you would like to speak on Z02-18, now would be the time. Please take the podium to my right, state your name, and you have three minutes. And if you do bring up any questions, they will be answered after your testimony. And, and, and by the way, I'm sorry, before he speaks, I, I was provided with this document before, the, before today's meeting, um, and I've reviewed it, and it accomplishes the objectives um, as I, I believe was intended to be achieved by the applicant as it relates to their restriction of the property. Okay. Tom Hamilton, I live at 1750 Jamaica Way, uh, budding the property that's under consideration. Uh, it, scenario, if uh, you were looking to rezone a property, uh, let's say not 1750, let's say Maria Court, right at the end of Maria Court. Uh, you know, someone came in here and bought a piece of property and said, I want to put a commercial building at the end of Maria Court. Would you even consider it? You really wouldn't consider it because it's inconsistent with the properties around it. And I would say that a commercial property is inconsistent with the area with the properties around it. The other thing that bothers me primarily about this property is that you're talking commercial property going in that particular position without a restriction on uses, okay? And I will bring up to you two uses that sounded like they were permitted.